So a really, really big thank you to all of you for everything that you have done over the last 14 months or so in responding to this global pandemic and this national emergency. I know that the last 14 months have been really, really difficult for us all, regardless of whether you're in the ambulance service or a different part of the NHS, paramedics, technicians, nurses, doctors, volunteers, community first responders, St John Ambulance, everybody that stepped forward to respond to this national emergency, including thousands of university students uh, that have been undertaking their, their studies at university, their paramedic science degrees, that gave up their studies, paused their studies, and stepped forward to support the ambulance service and other parts of the NHS, but predominantly support the ambulance services, paramedic students, to help all of our patients and to save as many lives as possible. You didn't need to have done that. Everyone in the ambulance service has gone above and beyond over the last 14 months or so, and you didn't need to have done that either, but you did. Everybody stepped forward when our country needed you most. And I am enormously grateful and very, very proud of you all. And an enormous thanks uh, from me as the National Strategic Advisor for everything that you have done and as importantly for everything you continue to do. And I think it's right as well that we take a moment just to remember those colleagues in the ambulance service across our country that in the fight against this dreadful uh, pandemic, this terrible COVID-19, that despite everyone's best efforts, they went in to fight this battle to help our patients and were unfortunate enough to succumb to the virus and are no longer with us. And it's right that we pay tribute to all of those colleagues that are no longer with us and consider and never forget what they did but also recognising their loved ones and their families for the sacrifice they gave as well in responding to this pandemic. We will never forget our colleagues that are no longer with us as a consequence of COVID. So a really big thank you for uh, inviting me to speak tonight. We're going to cover several points of discussion. I'm trying to try and give you some examples about how we've been dealing with this national emergency over the last uh, year or so, and then we'll have a chance at the end to open up for questions as well. And as Andrew said, if you type in your questions throughout my uh, presentation, then we'll, Andrew will be able to pick those up and pose those questions to, to me. I think it's fair to say that for some of you, you may be new to the service, others may have a long service. I've, I've been in the ambulance service nearly 35 years, and the last year dealing with this pandemic has been outside of all of our experience uh, and I've dealt with and responding to it responded to terrorist bombs um, I've responded to major emergencies I've commanded major emergencies at a local level a regional level and a national level whether it's been public order riots uh, major pileups on the motorways flooding CBRN incidents etc and all of this of course has been entirely outside of our experience Naturally, we've drawn upon the expertise and the experience that we've developed over our careers, but this has been something that's been quite extraordinary. And again, the way in which the ambulance service has stepped up is something that the public should, and I know, are absolutely and enormously proud of everything that you've all done to ensure that the ambulance service in our country, despite the enormous pressure that we've been under during those three waves, the initial wave last February, March, April, the sort of mini wave, the surge we had in November, and then the, the surge and the third wave in December and January. The way in which you stepped forward and maintained brilliant services for all of our patients, COVID patients and ev every other patient has been fantastic. I said just over a year ago, uh, when we could see the pandemic sweeping around the world and we saw uh, several other ambulance services overseas where they were under such enormous pressure that if it was the last breath in my body that I would do everything necessary to protect our ambulance service across the country 
and to maintain our critical national infrastructure of the 999 ambulance service. And we've delivered on that promise to the British people in maintaining our ambulance service for all of our patients, regardless of the enormous pressure that we've been under. And if we think about, you know, the initial requirement for information, the modelling that we did, and hopefully Andrew will be able to move on the slides to the planning assumption, slide three, um, there was a real desire for greater modelling and um, services really wanting to know uh, how busy we were going to be, when it was going to happen, what kind of patients might be presenting, etc. And the modelling was helpful. But what I was saying to services when I was given delegation authority just over a year ago uh, to oversee the ambulance service response across England, um, that's not to say I was responsible in any way for managing individual ambulance services. It's certainly not my role. But my role was to oversee the national response, the command response to this national emergency, working with the National Ambulance Coordination Centre, for which I have responsibility as well, to ensure that we maintained our position on the front foot. And what I was saying to ambulance services at that time in response to their request for more information and modelling was act now. Take whatever steps we need to now to protect the critical national infrastructure and to maintain a safe 999 ambulance service across England. We must act now. And what I was saying was if we act now and we mobilise all of our surge contingency and some of it might not be required, then that will put us in a stronger position to be able to provide mutual aid across the country or it will place less pressure on our frontline staff. But if we keep waiting for more and more modelling and keep talking about it and keep thinking about it, the risk was that we would be on the back foot. And I was trying to do everything I could to avoid us be, being on the back foot. So our first assumption in the first wave was around high call numbers and potentially low staff numbers, insufficient staff numbers to be able to, to cope. And that's why we were taking really difficult decisions about making sure we maintained our position on the front foot. And I have to admit, there were decisions I took that even I didn't like. But frankly, doing nothing was never an option. We had to take difficult decisions in order to protect our staff to help all of our patients and to save as many lives as possible. And despite a lot of the unknowns and uncertainties, I think overall we achieved that. Now I do accept and I absolutely acknowledge that our staff, particularly on the front line in control rooms and on ambulances, have been under enormous pressure, particularly in those three waves, in those three surges that we, that we saw. And as a testament to all of our staff, regardless of their role or indeed which part of the country they work in, they just kept marching forward every single day. And many, many staff going above and beyond in terms of cancelling leave, not taking their leave, working additional hours over time. And not just in their own operating area, but lots of crews working across borders, working in neighbouring ambulance services to provide mutual aid. And I'll come back to say more about mutual aid in a few minutes. And in the second wave, uh, over the Christmas and New Year period, we were concerned that we were going to have even fewer staff as a consequence of test and trace and the self-isolation uh, arrangements which were being put in place as well, which was a good thing, introduction of lateral flow tests as well, which potentially could take staff out that were asymptomatic that may otherwise have been continuing to work. But as I kept explaining to people, it's better that we know that they are, unfortunately, as it were, um, that they're contracted COVID and they're able then to self-isolate rather than carry on working, unbeknown to them, completely asymptomatic, but therefore potentially at risk of spreading COVID to other colleagues and therefore we further increase in abstractions and potentially other staff becoming at risk from contracting the, 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 the virus. And essentially what I've been trying to demonstrate over the last year or so is everything we've been doing has been about leadership. A very, very strong leadership from the top of organisations, each ambulance service having a very clear line of sight and strong command and control arrangements in place to ensure that we protect all of our staff by ensuring that they've got the right amount of PPE 
but also of the right quality. And I absolutely recognise that some of the PPE that was um, supplied in the early stages was fine, absolutely fine for working for NHS and health and care staff working in a controlled environment, maybe within a hospital or a GP surgery or other place. But for ambulance staff working on the front line, often in an uncontrolled environment, with um, being subjected to the elements of the weather where it's windy and, and, and the aprons are blowing up in, in, the, in the face of our frontline staff, the quality of the PPE was inadequate. And I know that lots of organisations, lots of ambulance services went to extraordinary efforts to ensure that their staff were protected by having the right amount of PPE, but also the right quality. Much thicker aprons, much larger aprons at the chest came up higher, they were longer uh, and wider to go around the side of the, uh, the staff bodies as well, recognising the uncontrolled environment that they were working in. So the strong command and control and, and really leading from the top is absolutely vital and ensuring as well through that leadership that it was sufficiently agile, that as new information became available, as uh, the Prime Minister was making announcements in the nightly briefings that were being held, uh, and therefore the impact that that was having on the NHS, on ambulance services, on 111, etc., that we were able to respond to that in a flexible way to continue to meet all the needs of our patients. But of course, it wasn't just about the leadership of the ambulance service. It was working across the NHS, but also across um, working with multi-agency partners through the strategic coordinating groups, working alongside the military, the police, fire and rescue service, local authorities, other parts of the NHS, Public Health England as well, to ensure that we had the latest information and that we were using that information in an intelligent way to predict what we needed to do going forward. And of course, whilst all this was going on, there was business as usual. Patients, unfortunately, were still having heart attacks, still having babies, and still having road accidents. Now, I accept in the lockdown periods that we've had, the three lockdown periods we've had, that uh, a lot of emergency activity did actually reduce quite substantially. And in many ways, the uh, activity that ambulance services experienced um, is an indicator of the pressures that then moved across and through the NHS. So in the build up to each of those surges, which then let, subsequently led to a lockdown in February, March last year, November last year, and then December, January, uh, when we had those surges um, over Christmas and, and the early part of this year. The ambulance service was under pressure weeks before that. In, emergency activity continued to increase. At some point, ambulance services being close to being overwhelmed, substantial mutual aid being provided as well. But of course, once the lockdown kicked in, much of the emergency activity reduced substantially. But of course, we still need to make sure that we've got arrangements in place to deal with all of those patients that do need an emergency response that might have nothing to do with COVID, even when the surges were particularly high. And, and I'm confident that all of you uh, did just that, uh, continue to deliver and continue to do the right thing um, for patients. And it was absolutely vital that we ensured we reminded ourselves that every patient counts. This, just wasn't, this wasn't just about COVID patients and the, and the national emergency, the global pandemic. It was about all of our patients, uh, all of our urgent patients, all of our emergency patients. Uh, and for those uh, ambulance, NHS ambulance services that provide PTS, it was also about prompt discharge management because we know that um, a reduced flow through the hospitals, congested emergency departments, isn't good for social distancing and reducing the transmission of the virus, but also leads to longer handover delays and ambulances being held outside emergency departments, unable to unload. And that's an ongoing piece of work. Uh, and I lead up as the SRO nationally on the uh, handover um, reduction programme. That's an ongoing piece of work that we still haven't cracked in every hospital. The good news is that majority of hospitals for the majority of time, don't have handover delays. They don't have a problem. It's the minority of hospitals that consistently are a challenge that we need to crack so that every hospital is able to accept patients promptly from ambulance crews to enable ambulance crews to wipe down and prepare for the next 
emergency. Uh, and the final thing I want to say about business as usual was the enormous pressure on our control rooms. You know, when we talk about ambulance services, particularly to you know friends, family, neighbours, etc., most people have a, um, an image in their mind of the ambulance service as being a paramedics and ambulances. And of course, that's a big part of what we do. But it's not everything. And the enormous pressure that was un, that staff were under in the control rooms um, was very, very evident. Uh, several control rooms had uh, outbreaks of COVID and were reliant on mutual aid, other ambulance services taking triple nine, so BT connecting 999 calls to ambulance services outside of the originating region. Uh, and those ambulance staff, as well as taking their own calls as business as usual, also taking thousands, sometimes thousands of 999 calls for other ambulance services and then passing those calls in the main through the ITK links that we put in place a little earlier. So I do absolutely want to pay tribute to all of the control room staff that uh, also went above and beyond, not just in terms of their own calls, but taking thousands of calls for other ambulance services as, as well. And in terms of change management and decision making, uh, the NAC, the National Ambulance Coordination Centre, was stood up um, to collect information from uh, all ambulance services, predominantly the 10 ambulance services in England, such that would inform national decision making about mutual aid, about the national deployment of the St John ambulance crews that were funded nationally. So I know that some ambulance services contract locally for St John ambulance who are also stepped forward. A lot of their volunteer crews have stepped forward, done a great job in supporting the NHS ambulance services right across the country, not just in England. But in addition to those local commissioned St John ambulance crews, uh, nationally, there was a national contingent of St John crews for which I have responsibility to deploy those crews into the regions which are under the most pressure. In the main, most of those crews remained within the regions that they originated from under the obviously the local um, control rooms. But when there were services under particular pressure, uh, we had occasions where the North uh, West was under a lot of pressure, Yorkshire, London and the South East. We mustered as many crews as we could from the surrounding regions into those ambulance services to provide them with the most capacity that we possibly could. Uh, and so the National Ambulance Coordination Centre was collecting information in uh, as part of a national SIT rep, which was collected every morning, which would inform strategic decision making, but also brief up the line into NHS England and other um, senior leaders to take an overview of what's happening across the NHS and the ambulance services and integral and a really important part of that oversight, um, as well as the day to day, hour by hour uh, overview that the National Ambulance Coordination Centre was taking in terms of uh, call stacking, crew availability, handover delays to try and support services and facilitate um, support, mutual aid and intervention where that was necessary with either the regions and or nationally where that was necessary as well. And the National Ambulance Coordination Centre continues to perform that role and will do so for as long as is necessary um, going forward. At the very beginning, uh, just over a year ago, I made it very clear that the staff welfare and protecting our staff was our absolute number one priority. And I make no apology for that at all. And that remains the case now because without our staff, whether they're in the control room, on the front line or the other vital functions to maintain a safe and effective 909 service across our country was not possible without our staff. Um, and I know that uh, in some areas it was a bit, a bit clunky uh, to start with, and I'm sorry that that happened, but we were working as hard as we could, as rapidly as we could to improve the position right across the country, both in terms of PPE, but also um, supporting our staff and the guidance about what PPE should be worn in what situations. And let me be clear, as I said in the very beginning, that this has been an emotional roller coaster for us all. It doesn't matter whether you're in a national role, leading an organisation, a paramedic on the front line, control and everything else. It has been an emotional roller coaster with the work pressures and, and, and many colleagues will have had family pressures as well, maybe uh, school children uh, at home, uh, partners uh, working from home, 
uh, partners furloughed or maybe made redundant as well. There's a whole raft of issues that everyone's had to deal with to a lesser or greater extent. And that support and that welfare, that health and well-being for all of our staff will continue for as long as is required. And if there's any more that I can do personally, then I'm very happy uh, to, to do that. Just let me know what further support I can provide and what further assistance I can facilitate uh, and I'm very happy to do what I can. We have listened to staff feedback and continually reaching out to get more feedback. And I'm in regular contact with the ambulance staff charity and the College of Paramedics, as well as other colleagues, unions and staff representatives as well, particularly Foundation Trust, where staff governors are on the Council of Governors. So a whole raft of different stakeholders to establish what further support we might be able to provide. So you can either let me know directly or if you prefer to go through one of those other uh, bodies so they can inform me, then I'm happy whichever way suits you best to receive that, receive that feedback. And of course, over the year, uh, we've dealt with lots of external factors and dealing with the unknown. Uh, the military and others did a great job in building the Nightingale hospitals um, in strategic locations right across the country. Many of them weren't used, and even those that were used were only used um, in a small way, which at one level is good because it demonstrates the NHS and the acute hospitals weren't overwhelmed. Um, but we need to continue to ensure that whilst we've made good progress over the last few months with increasing numbers of the population being vaccinated, increasing numbers of the population receiving their second vaccine, and the current levels of transmission of the virus is very low, that we simply don't know what might happen next. How effective will the, virus, will the vaccines continue to be against the dominant virus, but also the variants, how might that play out? Will boosters be required? Uh, there's obviously a lot of work going on, uh, but still a lot of questions remain unanswered. So it's really important that whilst we're sort of getting back into business as usual, and hopefully uh, our staff on the front line particularly are able to get, get their breath back, um, and whilst we try and lock in the improvements that we've made um, with transforming the ways in which emergency ambulance care is provided, our conveyance rates, for example, across the country as an average are the, are the lowest they've ever been. They were um, low as well last year, particularly during the immediately after the, the introduction of the lockdown. But what further steps could we take? to ensure that we support our staff to make the right safe decisions to reduce conveyance rates and keep them as low as they currently are. What further work can we build in to lock in the improvements we've made in relation to prompt discharge management? There are some ambulance services that are collecting patients ready for discharge within two hours of the patient being made ready and well over half of those patients being collected within an hour which is great to help support flow through hospitals, reduce congestion in emergency departments, and be able to accept patients from ambulances into emergency departments. But that's not universal, and we need to make, we need to make that universal right across the country. So it's really important that we learn and embed what we've learned over the last year, but continue to be prepared for any further surge that may occur or any other disruptive challenge that may occur over the next few months, because there are still too many, uh, still too many unknowns. And the surge contingency capacity that many ambulance services deployed in the first wave a year ago and over the winter by deploying warranted police officers to drive emergency ambulances, firefighters to drive emergency ambulances and military personnel to drive emergency ambulances. We need to ensure that those arrangements where they worked well, uh, where they may now have been stood down, are sufficiently prepared to mobilise again if that were necessary. Now, of course, we all hope it won't be necessary, but if ambulance services have built those contingency plans, those surge contingency plans, 
on those assumptions and they need to ensure that if the requirement re-emerges that they're able to mobilize quickly and that some of the lessons that we'll learn about um, some delay in mobilizing the surge contingency is eradicated if there were further surges and speed up that process so that we don't have staff under too much pressure and that did happen staff were under far too much pressure in many parts of the country and in some parts of the country patients were waiting too long for ambulance ambulances and we need to make sure that we speed up those decision making processes being led by the reap levels in ambulance services and i'm pleased to say that seven ambulance services now at, at reap level two uh, which is great position to be in two ambulance services are at reap level one and only one ambulance service at reap level three and they've only escalated in the last in the last week or so so we are in a far better position but we need to make sure that we maintain that and we're ready to escalate if the requirement if the requirement requires us to do so in terms of managing expectations the last year has been um, you know really challenging in, in terms of managing colleagues um, expectations whoever whoever they are and I think the first thing to say is you know that we shouldn't um, lower our own expectations at our own standards despite how difficult it is it's really important that we maintain a high standard that we continue to aspire to that we continue to deliver to for our staff and for our patients and of course the partner organizations that have worked with us over the last year as well and really important as well that we continue to provide um, sufficient capacity where it's possible that we're able to support neighbouring ambulance services with mutual aid uh, where that might be possible as well and we're looking to um, review the arrangements about how we can mobilise mutual aid more quickly and in a sustained way rather than the ad hoc arrangements which we had over the last over the last year in any major incident in any emergency there is always um, a huge requirement for data uh, more and more information uh, and, and trying to manage that is really difficult and 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 very often i you know i learned a few years ago it's easy uh, to ask for more and more information and sometimes the more information you're given the more information you want it sometimes presents more questions than it does provide answers a few years ago i learned to ask myself what are you going to do with the information that you are considering asking of my organization or my teams? Um, and many of you know me really well. I've worked in the ambulance a long time and, and across most parts of the country. And I do a lot of work by email. And, you know, I think to myself when I type the email asking for something before I press the send button, I always think to myself, when you've been provided with that, what are you going to do with it? How is it going to help? the service how's it going to help patients how's it going to save more lives how's it going to support our staff and probably I'm slightly exaggerating for effect but probably half the emails i press the delete button without actually sending it because i'm just asking information information for the sake of it it'd be nice to know it would be useful to know but probably not actually going to do anything with it um and it's really important that we pay attention to what the priorities are that we're able to cut through all the noise all the disruption, all the distractions that other people are generating, often in good faith, I'm not being disrespectful at all of, of others, but it's senior leaders' jobs, commanders' roles, regardless of what level, to cut through all that and to focus on what's really important, to only ask for information that you need, that you have a high confidence level that you will then act upon and, and use that information to inform what further decisions are required. And in many ways, of course, that draws upon the JESIP principles about shared decision-making, shared um, information sharing, shared risk assessments, et cetera. So it's a building on those principles in many ways, um, but also recognizing that, you know, very often people do have information requests and we, we, there's a balance to be had between meeting that request, but also being clear about how it will be used to inform better information. And I mentioned Jessica and I mentioned commanders and resilience and empowering commanders is again really, really important from a strategic point of view, taking an oversight, whether it's at a national level or a regional level, you're not able to get, and it's not right, that you get bogged down in the detail. You need to be assured that 
the decisions that are being taken at a national or regional level are being implemented safely on the front line for staff and for patients. Um, but it's absolutely essential that tactical commanders, operational commanders, strategic commanders are empowered um, to be able to then deliver on those objectives that have either been set for them or been handed to them. And that there's resilience of those commanders as well. We've never had an emergency in this country that's gone off, uh, gone on for so long. We just, we just haven't. You know, if you think about many of the other emergencies, whether it's sort of regional uh, or over a large area, whether it's very inclement weather, you know, disruptive snow or severe disruptive flooding, public order, et cetera, et cetera. They generally don't last more than a few weeks, and either the snow melts or the water abates or, the, or uh, public order has, uh, um, has been resolved. And this has gone on now for a good 14 months, and we're still in it. You know, let's not forget we are still in it, and we mustn't let our guard down now. So it's really important that we support and provide the resilience for our commanders as well, uh, and making sure that they're given the time, the space, the feedback uh, and that they know, that they absolutely know that they're being supported. Uh, and that's not the same as saying that, you know, if there are, are areas for further improvement, that we give constructive and helpful feedback, um, but it's absolutely vital, regardless of individuals' roles or their position within that um, line of command, that, we're, that, uh, that we support them, absolutely vital. And the media and public support, needs to be handled appropriately as well. And certainly in the early stages of this emergency and subsequently and throughout the emergency, the support from the public has been fantastic um, and has been a real, a real boost, a real lift for all of us. You know, I, I, there, I'm sure there will have been an occasion, um, and certainly for me, lots of occasions, where something has happened and, you know, the lump is in the throat, the tears are rolling down the face, because of something that the public have done in recognising everything that you have done, everything that you continue to do to help the public, support the public in saving as many lives as possible. And whilst we've been in lockdown, we've been protecting the public, we've been shielding the public, you have come out from your homes every day, every night, Put yourselves at risk in doing the right thing, stepping forward in this national emergency. And the public have been enormously um, thankful and very grateful uh, for everything that you have done and everything you continue to do. And it's right that we continue to update the public on the progress that we have made, on the fantastic work that you continue to deliver every single day in response to COVID, but also um, the day job as well. Um, and then finally, in terms of learning lessons, of course, if we had this national emergency again, if we could take the clock back 14, 15, 16 months, and in some examples, even longer, what would we do differently? Some ambulance services have respiratory hoods, some don't, some continue to use FFP3. Some ambulance services have personal issue respiratory hoods, personal issue for all of their staff individually. Um, some ambulance services have uh, provided a, additional um, thicker quality aprons, for example, personal issue coveralls, et cetera, et cetera. If we went back before anyone had ever heard of COVID, would our preparations have been different? Question mark. But we are where we are now. But what's really important is that the lessons that we have learned over the last 14 months, what would we do differently now? Because as I've said already, we're still in this national emergency. We're still dealing with this pandemic. And it's absolutely right that if there are things that we could have learned that we could have done differently, that we do it now. We act now to continue to protect our staff, to help all of our patients and to save as many lives as possible. And whilst the position is much improved now and with the vaccination program, hopefully the situation will continue to improve. We don't know what the next few months will be. We don't know what the winter next year will bring. Now, I know we're just only out of this winter, and you will all know that, um, those of you that know me, I don't like the cold. 
I, I much prefer the warmer weather. It's an age thing. When I was younger, I didn't mind. Now I'm old. I can't bear the cold. And, I'm, and I need warmth and sunshine. So, of course, I want the summer. I don't want to be talking about the winter, but we need to prepare for the winter now. It's only six months or so away. We need to prepare for the winter now. Some services will have backlogs of training to clear from last year. We need to do that this new year that we're now three weeks into, as well as doing all the other things that we would do every year anyway, mandatory training, refresher training, PDPs, et cetera, et cetera. We need to do that this new year and catch up on the deferred training and the backlog training, et cetera, that some services will not have been able to have completed in the year that's just finished and get ready for the next winter. It can't come as a surprise. We need to make sure we maintain our position on the front foot. And I know that services are doing everything they can to achieve that ambition. Uh, and I know that um, we would continue to do everything we can to support uh, all of our staff and the wider NHS in doing that. And then in closing, and then we can open up for questions. The final thing I wanted to say was to reinforce the point I've made already. And I know this is really, really boring, but we, we can't give up now. You've done such a great job. We owe it to everyone, particularly those colleagues, those staff, those loved ones that we've lost to COVID. We can't give up now. It's really important that we continue to wear PPE, that we regularly wipe down our equipment, our workstations, et cetera, that we continue to use hand sanitizer and regular hand washing, good social distancing and wearing of face um, uh, face masks as well. All of that's really, really important. And let's not forget, ambulance staff are held in very, very high regard by the public. All of you, all of us, we are role models to our communities. What our local communities see us do as role models, we can encourage our local communities, our neighbours, our families, our loved ones to do the right thing good social distancing, compliance with the rules, regular hand hygiene, etc. All of that is so, so important. We mustn't give up now. And if you've not already had your COVID vaccination, I'd certainly encourage you to do so. The evidence is strong that the vaccine will protect you, protect your colleagues, protect your loved ones and protect your families. An enormous thank you for everything you've done in this really, really challenging period. I am enormously proud of all of you, and I stand firm to continue to do everything I can to support you and to get you the recognition that you all rightly deserve in saving so many lives 